Hello, and welcome to our final week of English 3020. In his 1855 Song of Myself, Walt Whitman dedicates a few stanzas to answering a child's question, what is the grass? So Whitman writes, and now it seems to me the beautiful uncut hair of graves, and goes on to explain how that hair belongs to many young men and women, as well as old men and women, who are no longer with us on this earth. And he continues on, They are alive and well somewhere. The smallest sprout shows there is really no death. And if ever there was, it led forward life, and does not wait at the end to arrest it, and ceased the moment life appeared. All goes onward and outward. Nothing collapses. And to die is different from what anyone supposed, and luckier. So these themes of life and death and the cyclical nature of both really kind of resonate with our discussion last week for dandelion wine and also offer some context for the idea of endings also being new beginnings and everything continuing in this cycle. I am hoping that throughout this semester some words have inspired you and, and stuck with you like Walt Whitman's words have inspired and stuck with me. So join me together as we close the chapter on English 3020. Loria Anzaldúa is our first author for our last video of English 3020. She was born in 1942 and died in 2004. And Gloria Anzaldúa was born in Jesus Maria of the Valley in South Texas, which was a ranch settlement where several families lived together on the same land. Her parents were very poor, but they did their best to provide for their four children. So at the age of 11, Anzaldúa moved away from the ranch settlement to Hargill, Texas. She had one sister and two brothers, she and her sister were the only two children to graduate from high school, while her parents never actually attended high school. At the age of 15, Anzaldúa's father died, so she and the family had to work together in order to make a living. And she and her family would travel from Texas to Arkansas to make money as migrant workers. And she actually did farm work until she earned her BA in 1969 from Pan American University. She then went on to earn an MA in English and Education after a few years of teaching, three years later from the University of Texas at Austin. And at a young age, Ansel Dua really rebelled against the expectations and kind of prescribed gender roles of her Chicano household, which she described as strict. She was the only one in her family, and as she later told interviewers, the only one in her area to go to college. She was also a lesbian, something her mother did not support, which led her to have a very complicated relationship with her mother and the rest of her family. Later in life, she pursued a PhD at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and this came about after she spent a few years studying for a PhD at the University of Texas at Austin, where they would actually not let her fully embrace the Chicano and feminist topics she wanted to study. And throughout her career as an instructor, she taught both literature and creative writing at the college level. She completed her PhD shortly before her death, and she ended up dying from complications with diabetes. Her most famous work is called Borderlands La Frontera, the New Mestiza, which uses the Mexican-American border as a kind of springboard for a discussion of a whole host of other topics like belonging, identity, politics, social issues, gender expectations, homosexuality. The work combines English and Spanish, which is kind of a common feature of Ansel Dua's work, as well as poetry and prose to deliver its messages. So she was kind of very interested in creating this hybrid structure that kind of drew on both parts of her identity, or all parts of her identity. And she's really kind of most famous for being an author and scholar in the field of feminism, um, especially feminism focusing on people of color and people of the third world. And she's also a key finger in Chicano or Chicana studies, which kind of incorporates Latinos, Mexican Americans, and Chicano or Chicana is sort of another term for Mexican Americans that some members of that community use um, to identify themselves. It's kind of a choice. There's political associations, social connotations wrapped up in that. And her kind of goal as both a teacher and instructor and a writer was to give a voice to women of color both in her works and in her classroom practices. And this you know, kind of has led to controversy in her life, which she did not really shy away from. She was very interested in inclusionary feminism that included all women of all colors and races, as well as kind of an activist for various political causes. Ursula K. Le Guin is our second author for this week and one of my personal favorite authors of all time. She was born in 1929 and is still alive today. Her birthplace was Berkeley, California, and her father, Alfred Krober Le Guin, was an anthropologist, while her mother, 
Theodora Coval Brown was a writer. Her father was famous for studying the culture of the California Native Americans, and his work, as well as her mother's work, may have influenced the power of her world and culture building in her own writing. Le Guin had three older brothers. Le Guin started writing at the age of five and actually submitted her first piece of writing to a journal at around 11 years old. It was rejected, but about 20 years later, that same magazine that originally rejected her would go on to publish some of her work. And Le Guin's home was full of intellectuals and storytelling because of the occupations and the sort of crowd that her parents associated with. And this environment, you know, probably had a, a pretty big influence on Le Guin. She studied at Radcliffe College for her undergraduate degree and then got her graduate degree from Columbia University. She started on a PhD program studying in France, but on the way over to France, she met Charles Le Guin in 1953. They married that Christmas in France where they were both studying, and they ended up having three children together. The couple moved to Portland, Oregon, and she and her husband live in the same home in which they raise their children. And like Bradbury, Le Guin is very much associated with the genre of science fiction. And while much of her work does fit on use elements of this genre, like Bradbury as well, this is not sufficient to explain her genius and, again, kind of all the things she's doing in her work. Her work, though, also in addition to science fiction, and again, similar to Bradbury, uses elements of fantasy. And one biographer refers to her work as social science fiction, as again, like Bradbury, it often addresses contemporary issues. So both these authors are using the power of science fiction and fantasy in order to comment on the world they see around them in a fantastical way. Many of her books involve an exploration of gender and gender roles, and how they're constructed, as well as the relationship between humans and the natural world, or any kind of life form, whether it be alien or human, and how it kind of relates to its environment. And many of her novels are linked by setting. Oftentimes they're set in the same world, in the same kind of history, um, with interconnected characters. And like Bradbury, she was a very prolific author, dabbling in many different types of writing. She wrote novels, short stories, essays, poetry, and screenplays, and she also kind of writes about the process of writing. And if you're looking for any teacher recommendations, I'm really a fan of her young adult work, The Annals of the Western Shore Trilogy, which starts with her book Gifts. Kind of a strange, satirical, funny, profound, and moving book called The Lathe of Heaven, which deals with the nature of reality. And her retelling of the story of Aeneas from classical Greek myth, Lavinia, from the point of view of his second wife. And our final author of this class is Sherman Alexie, who was born in 1966 and is still alive today. And Alexi grew up on the Spokane Indian Reservation in Welpinit, Washington, which is right outside of Spokane, Washington. Through his mother, Alexi is a member of the Spokane Indian tribe. Alexi had five siblings and was mostly raised by his mother, as his biographies state his kind, alcoholic father often left the family for periods of time to fend for themselves. As a baby, he suffered from hydrocephalus, which involves having fluid in the brain, which made it necessary for him to have surgery at six months old. He was not expected to survive the surgery, but obviously he did. And so in addition to his struggles in his earlier life, Alexei's older sister died in a trailer fire when she and her husband were passed out as a result of drinking alcohol and did not wake up in order to escape. And alcoholism um, is a major issue he deals with in his writing, and he actually deals with this specific event in his book for young adults, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, which is a fabulous book and I highly recommend. And Alexei was an intelligent child, and he chose to actually attend high school in Reardon, where he and the school mascot were the only Indians. And he did this because he wanted to get a better education than the one he was receiving at the reservation school. And Alexei actually did very well both in academics and on the basketball court, a sport he loves to this day. He attended Gonzaga University and then Washington State University, originally intending to go into medicine. While at Washington State, however, he had a creative writing class that really changed his career aspirations around. He ended up switching to American Studies and discovered his talent for writing through that creative writing class. At the age of 23, Alexei had developed a drinking problem, but when he found out his first book was to be published, he gave up alcohol, and then within the kind of early 1990s, he went on to publish quite a few of his famous works. He and his wife and his two sons now live in Seattle, Washington. And Alexei writes in a lot of different genres. He writes poetry, short stories, novels, he even does stand-up comedy on occasion. One of his early works, a collection of stories called The Lone Ranger and Tonto Fistfight in Heaven, was actually adapted into a movie called Smoke Signals, for which he wrote the screenplay. He recently published a memoir about his now-deceased mother called You Don't Have to Say You Love Me, 
And Alexei's work really focuses on these ideas of identity and exploring that identity, which we've seen throughout our American literature this semester, the ideas of otherness, as well as the contemporary Native American experience. It also draws from the traditions of Indian storytelling, kind of trying to get back to that oral culture. It discusses the reality of the American Indian experience in today's world, but it also uses humor, satire, and sarcasm to deliver hard truths. So if you're liking this short piece we're reading from him, I highly encourage you to check out some of his short story collections or even some of his novels.